You're listening to the Swap Society Podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole Robertson. I interview thought leaders and change makers who are working to create a more sustainable and equitable world through fashion, art, and activism. Join us for a dose of climate optimism as we envision a brighter future. Hey everyone, welcome to the Swap Society podcast. Today I'm talking with Jennifer Milkey. She's a sustainable style coach and the co-founder of Style Crush. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Hello, lovely. Thanks for having me. So where are you talking to us from today and where are you from originally? (laughs) So I am in Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles and um, I usually say I spent my childhood in Ohio. (laughs) My heart lives in Brooklyn. And my physical body is here in LA. (laughs) (laughs) So what is a sustainable style coach and how did you become a sustainable style coach? Tell us about your journey. Yeah, um, honestly, I kind of made it up. There was nothing I had ever heard of before I started calling myself that. Um, But I I have a very long relationship with really enjoying style and um, really appreciating the way that style, like the way that the clothes that you wear can really impact how you show up in the world. And uh, it was always just kind of like my side thing. I mean, I I worked in fashion as a day job for most of my 20s um, in a bunch of different roles. And it was always just something that I loved. And and then I kind of took a right turn and I started working in holistic health. And I was teaching yoga and um, working, I I became a health coach. And then I started working for this functional medicine doctor in New York. And I had my first kid and I found the experience of becoming a mom very um, unmooring. Like I didn't, I was 33, you know, and I had, so I'd had like 12 years of becoming a woman or like an adult human being. (laughs) And I knew who that person was more or less, you know, and then I became a mom and I was like, whoa, this is like totally different requirements, totally different everything about my life, you know, and, uh, and I didn't quite know like how the, like who that knew me was yet. And I floundered around about it for a while. And because I was health coaching, I had, you know, done some coaching lessons that leaned more towards like transformational coaching and like why we don't do the things that we know that we should do basically. Um, so it kind of broadened from health coaching a bit. And I wanted to talk to women about this experience of like, how do we, how do we bridge like individual and motherhood and in a way that feels cohesive. And I talked to all these women, they were like, Oh my gosh, I totally understand that experience. I went through it myself. And then I'd be like, great, I have a coaching program for that, you know? And it was like, oh, I don't have time to pay attention to this stuff for myself. Um, So interestingly enough, in my own personal journey, I started, the way that I found my way back to myself was finding the clothes that I love to wear again and like dressing again, like finding the new me's style. And, um, and, And interestingly enough, those same women who like didn't have time for coaching around like this mother individual thing were actually really open to the ideal of style coaching because I think it was a much more immediate pain point you know that feeling of like waking up in the morning and looking in your closet and being like no 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 maybe but I don't know how to wear it no and then you're like Ugh, I have nothing to wear and the day feels like a drag <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I, I started, uh, I started style coaching really sort of randomly out of that. And it became this really interesting way to talk to people about like what it means to be a woman in the world right now and how you find your authentic style. And, um, of course I had the sustainability side to it. A lot of people who came to me weren't looking for that piece of it. They were looking for style support. Um, and then I was like, Hey, have you heard a second (laughs) hand? Because I'm going to help you buy more of it. Um, and then I'm going to help you figure out how to mix it up in your wardrobe. And uh, and that's how I got into it. Yeah. How did you get into secondhand fashion? Well, I was, um, I, <laughs> I have a family that likes to go to like flea markets and antique stores. So I did that from the time I was really young. And, um, and then when I was in college, I don't know, I started thrifting. And in acting school, they made us do uh, this book called The Artist's Way, 
um, which is an amazing book, really fun. If you're like a creative person, you want to like find yourself as an artist. But one of the things that the book says that you have to do is like a weekly artist's date. And I was sitting acting. So probably my artist date should have been like, I don't know, reading plays or going to see plays or something. But every week I was like, I'm going to go thrifting for my artist date. <laughs> and I just loved to like, I just love to find the vintage stuff in the thrift stores. And this was in the late nineties. So there's still a lot of stuff from like the fifties and the sixties. And it was just so delightful. And, um, I don't know. I think I found my sense of style came, came out in a really authentic way because I was choosing what I was like attracted to on the rack as versus like choosing an outfit in a merchandised store. Um, and so that's why I started. And then in the like in the late aughts, I started asking some really, you know, the uncomfortable questions about the impact of the fashion industry and both socially and environmentally. And I obviously the answers are not great. And um, and so I decided to stop shopping retail altogether because I wanted to take my money out of that. And for me, it was a pretty easy transition because I just went from like ignoring everything on the rack that hung between the vintage pieces to actually looking at everything on the rack and even then I mean this was 2009 and I was blown away by how much practically unworn secondhand clothes were in the in the in the thrift stores and that has only increased since then as fast fashion has kind of exploded um yeah so it was a really easy transition for me and now it's been like 13 years that I have basically not I mean, every once in a while, I, I buy something new, but for the most part, all secondhand. We've been on a very similar timeline. <laughs> yes, I know there's so much overlap. <laughs> and so I can, I can completely relate, especially about, you know, I also was thrifting. I started thrifting in college, but it was f to hunt for those cool, unique pieces. Exactly. And... It was so exciting. I loved it. There was nothing that I loved more than driving to some random neighborhood of Chicago with one of my really good friends and exploring, you know, oh, we haven't been to this thrift store yet. Let's go to this one. Yes. You know? and, yes. And literally just combing through everything. Mm. I've I still have some of the gems from back then that I found that I just that I cherish and, and love. And it's it can be really fun. But not everybody likes that process, right? No. We're, we're, it's a special kind of torture or delight. Like, yeah, yeah. Depending on who you are. Yeah, depending on what you So, you know, which is part of why I think in, you know, leading into kind of what you're working on right now with Style Crush is, is probably how you've kind of led to Style Crush, if I'm if I'm correct. So, you know, tell us what Style Crush is and what it's all about. And, you know. Yeah. Well, it's funny it, that that's exactly that. <laughs> when I, I, I when I realized that there were all these great new clothes in the thrift store, I was immediately like, oh, my gosh, more women need to buy these clothes instead of new clothes. And, and I would try and take my friends thrifting with me. And I have like one or two friends who are really into it. But I got a lot of blank stares or like, just like, uh, you got, I don't like the smell. I don't like the disorganization. I can't find what I want. Get me out of here. So I was like, all right, I need a new approach because just like evangelizing people on the thrift store is not working. <laughs> um, and so I started when I was thrifting, I would like pull things for people and I just like add to my whatever, like, oh, oh, hey, cousin next time I see you, I've got like a bag of secondhand clothes for you. And I'm just like, Hey, I thought you might like these, you know, do you want them? And, uh, and I did like my cousins and my besties and my mother-in-law. And like, I mean, I did this a lot and people loved that. So it was like very apparent that it wasn't the secondhand part. It was the process part. And so that's when I, um, started thinking about style coaching and how I could use like a one-on-one -on -one sort of concierge process to get more secondhand in people's closets. And it worked really well. People loved it, but I didn't want to be a, I, I didn't actually want to do one-on-one -on -one styling. Uh, I was really interested in if figuring out if there was a way to like shift consumer behavior 
in a much bigger way. When I was um, a health coach for that functional medicine doctor, you know, we, I saw people have amazing transformations in their health. And it wasn't because they suddenly like learned something that they should do that they had never done before. I didn't know they should do. It was because we helped them to shift to the point where the healthy choice was like their preference. And that's what I wanted to do for like consuming and secondhand. I wanted to help people shift out of these sort of destructive patterns of capitalism and become better shoppers and just being like a one-on-one -on -one personal stylist wasn't going to do that. So I started thinking about if there were ways that we could automate what I was doing for those personal styling clients in, in like a marketplace format and use technology to kind of scale that process. And also accessibility was really important to me um, because I was charging almost nothing like a thousand dollars a year for like full-time styling support. Like people could text me anytime. It was very light cost-wise for what I was doing, but it's still such an enormous cost for people. And I think um, everybody should have access to style that they really feel great about. And uh, so I wanted to see if there was also a way that we could use technology to kind of democratize that as well. And it just so happens like in the time since then, I also see how there's been this huge sustainable fashion movement that sprung up, which is so good and it's so important, but it's also really out of reach for a lot of people because of the budget and because it doesn't fit their style or it doesn't fit their body. And so secondhand offers this, I mean, as you know, <laughs> secondhand offers this um, solution that serves all of those things together. Yeah. Yeah. So. so, so what is style? Crush? <laughs> what is style crush? Sorry. <laughs> so there's all my values behind it. So style crush, uh, it's a, it's an online resale marketplace and, um, we're using kind of a hybrid model. So it's both, there's a centralized entity that sells things on it. And then we also work with reseller stylists and our whole focus is just, um, making secondhand an easier first choice for buyers because um, you and I might be able to, you know, be fine doing secondhand because we can walk into a thrift store and find what we love and know how to mix it up. But that's just not the experience for so many people. So we're trying to build something that gives people who otherwise wouldn't be shopping for thrift clothes uh, an easy and enjoyable way to do that. And we do that largely by centering the, the um, style in the browsing process. So you don't have to know what you want when you come in, you can come in and browse from like an outfit inspiration bank and then you get one click access. Well, right now we're in the MVP stage. So only it's two click access, but two clicks <laughs> to go from an outfit that you like to really related items in the marketplace. So the idea is to make it easy for buyers and have it be fun and also help them know how to get more use out of clothes they already own because each outfit in the outfit inspiration bank is broken down into its component parts. And um, you could come in and just say like, oh, I have a shirt that looks kind of like that. Let me see what other ways people are styling this. And it's really easy to click through and find that as well. So how are you feeling? How How's everything going? <laughs> I mean, you know startup life. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun <laughs> <laughs> and so I mean we've done so that's just what we what we are as a marketplace because I and that's not complicated enough building a two-sided marketplace which is like uh, so challenging but then we also uh I decided about a year and a half ago that I didn't want to go the VC route to take to, to get the funding for the project and uh, we decided to make it a member owned cooperative. So um, that has been a whole additional journey because there's not really like co-ops are so old in this country. They've been around for hundreds of years and there's some really huge like Ocean Spray is a co-op, Organic Valley, Cabot Creamery. There's like these really big cooperatives out there but they're usually like ag, agriculture based cooperatives and um, so there's not really a roadmap yet for taking those co-op principles and building it in the scale that technology offers. So we're trying to figure out how to do that. 
which is fun and exciting to be like on the front end of that wave because I think it's I think it's something a wave that's growing people are thinking about different ways to do business um for us a big part of the reason why we went to be a co-op was because we wanted to be able to distribute profits widely um but also because um we wanted to be able to control the priorities and what we developed. You know, I think I always laugh that um, Poshmark is like my favorite nemesis <laughs> because it's so huge and there's so much stuff on it, but they've prioritized all of these features, like the way that the thing itself works requires, whether you're a buyer or a seller, it requires spending like an inordinate amount of time on the platform trying to find anything and sorting and filtering is terrible and keyword use is really inconsistent and it's all such like a hodgepodge which is really good for going from series a to series b to series you know it's like great for raising hundreds of millions of dollars in capital because you can go like look i've got eight million people are on my platform every week and they spend you know 30 minutes a day on it well yeah investors love that but they have to do that because it's a terrible user experience <laughs> so <laughs> um yeah so we didn't want to have to go down that path we wanted to build something that was really like for our community by our community based on what our community valued so co-ops give you this really exciting really great way to be able to do that to prioritize like the features that actually serve your users but unfortunately they do not give you a really great way to raise capital and of course as you well know when you're building a tech platform capital is really important because not only is the platform itself so expensive but also the i mean you know I, like again poshmark is so interesting to me because they make you know what i think 250 million dollars they made last year and they're still operating at a loss because they're spending tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on marketing to get these huge numbers of people into the platform so you got to do things a little bit differently when you're a co-op <laughs> yeah that's so interesting and i i actually listened to a podcast that the founder of Rent the Runway was on recently, and they are also still operating at a loss, even though they've done their IPO. Mm -hmm. And it is it is really interesting. And it is it's like, on the one hand, you know, all of these secondhand and rental opportunities are definitely the direction that everything is going. At the same time, it inherently has a lot of challenges that the traditional fashion and e-commerce, you know, industry doesn't have to deal with at this point. Yeah. Um, so it's like exciting, like, yay, we're doing this really cool, interesting <laughs> stuff. This is the future and it's so good. This problem, yay. <laughs> but it's really hard. Yeah, no, it's really hard. Um, so I feel, I feel that with you. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, but then when I, when I hear those things too, it's kind of like, oh. I know. So what what can we do Where differently? We We're like this other generation um, of of founders, you know, <laughs> trying to do something. We need to do it different somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that that's just the way that that specific system works. You know, like venture backed entities, like that's what you do. You throw all of the money that you raise back into the business, but almost to a fault. You know, it's like 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 scale now and figure out how to be profitable later and i think it remains to be seen in a lot of cases particularly in marketplaces if that's a wise thing to do with your hundreds of millions of dollars i'm like just give me two million i mean who knows if our thing can work either but <laughs> i shouldn't talk i'm not making 150 or 250 million dollars a year so I often think that when I look at like their p and sheets, because what else does a founder do for fun but read your competition's p &L statements? I'm always like, is this, am I, like, is this going to happen? Can this happen? But I think that there, I, I, I have hope that something can happen. <laughs> Clearly, right? That's why we keep at it. Uh, I think that there's like a desire though, too, for for a different model, right? Especially in our space where so many people who are thinking about secondhand are doing it because of values alignment. 
I think that there is a fatigue around these companies where the founders are worth hundreds of millions of dollars and the average users just trying to like eke out a supportive side hustle or like a reasonable career. And I think what both of us are doing gives gives people an alternative to those that feels refreshing. I don't know. I tell people about Swap Society all the time. Thank and you. everybody's always like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Especially I love, I'm like, they, I'm like, they have great stuff and it's so easy and it's so affordable and like they take everything, which I'm not a I'm not like a labels person myself at all. So I don't care if it's from wherever, as long as it's a cute piece that actually speaks to me and I really like it. And I think it's so important what you guys are doing um, because there isn't, there's not a lot of good ways to deal with the, like the lower value things in the resale model, just because selling things one at a time is inherently very expensive. I mean, you know, you still have to process all the stuff. So. <laughs> we sure do. Um, <laughs> Well, and that's the thing too. And I mean, one of the reasons that I started swapping as an individual and why I eventually started Swap Society was because trying to sell your clothes takes a lot of effort, right? So if you're, if you're trying to sell your clothes online, you have to take all the pictures, you have to write the description, you have to warehouse everything, you have to answer customer service, you have to it's pick and so pack much. and ship. It's so much work. And I specifically said when you try to sell your clothes exactly. because there's no so guarantee much doesn't sell. And so right. you spend all of that time and then you may or may not get anything in, in exchange for it. And if you go to those consignment shops or those resale shops. <laughs> it's so demoralizing. Why is it so, de do you feel, I always feel horrible when I walk out of those stores. I'm like, I know I have good style. Why do I feel like trash right now? It's incredible to me. I remember one time not too long ago, I went in with a garbage, like a black trash bag full of designer men's clothes okay yeah. like really nice shirts so many things and they took three things out of the whole bag and I said and I knew this was going to happen right because I experienced this as an individual in the past which is why I stopped even trying to go to those places because yeah you feel kind of you know you almost feel humiliated right it's You're weird like I don't it's literally it's like demoralizing <laughs> And I don't, I mean, it shouldn't be because I'm like, who are you to judge my stuff? But I always <laughs> walk out of there feeling really bad. And I had that too. Like I went not that long ago to like a place in Studio City um, with like two big shopping bags full of things. Everything that I took had like original values over $200. And they, they kept one, not even nice, Marc Jacobs yellow raincoat. And they gave me, four dollars for it <laughs> it's like, insane why? it's insane why even bother? let's talk style for a moment how has your style evolved over time how would you describe your style today and, and how would you say it's changed over the years I'm so bad at this question <laughs> <laughs> I think in my 20s I was like super into or like my teens and my 20s I was really into like old Hollywood glamour and I had all of these amazing vintage dresses from my grandma who was like the perfect 1950s housewife and they fit me and so that was like totally my gem um and then when I had my kids I was like either my like <laughs> threshold for discomfort really came down or just my rib cage expanded and never went back but I, from then on I was like I'm not wearing these dresses anymore which is probably why I had no idea what to wear <laughs> um but I don't know my style's really eclectic it usually involves lots of prints all at once. In New York, I was like, it was very easy. I knew how to dress. I felt like very New York and like super comfortable, like quirky and, you know, but I feel like in LA, I, I don't know how to be a person in LA because the style is different here, but also because of the temperature swings. Like when you start out every morning freezing in like three sweaters and then by noon, you're like, oh my God, why am I wearing anything at all? And then like, you're back to all those sweaters again at night I don't have my layering game is just not strong enough for Los Angeles <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out four years later but two of those years were COVID so those didn't count 
Oh. <laughs> I mean, talk about a major change in how right. everybody <laughs> dresses or doesn't and, right. you know, all of those things. I was running a fashion startup for you during COVID. Awful. <laughs> so weird, right? <laughs> I, was, I was doing user interviews in June of 2020. And I would ask people questions and they would literally be like, well, are we talking about now or are we talking about before? And then it was like this perpetual, like, when does, when is the now, the new now? And what does the new now look like? Yeah, it's been fun. I mean, it is, it is so intense because it's affected everybody, right? But when you're small, it's even harder. And then yeah. my kids didn't go to school for 18 months. <laughs> Oh, well, not, not quite that long, but almost, yeah. So long for us, sorry. Yeah, yeah. so it's it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, anyway, here we are. <laughs> Trucking through, it's still trying to do it. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I love a good fashion love story. Do you have a favorite piece in your closet? And, and mm. what is it and what do you love about it? Well, I did just, I have a new favorite piece. It's like brand new. I got it for my birthday and it is actually new clothes, which I can't tell you the last time I bought something new, but it was this outrageous dress. It's like a tent. Dress. It's like a tent dress <laughs> in like beige cotton, which is completely not my color at all. And it has a giant sun on it and the rays like expand out and there's like hand applique. It's gorgeous. Um, and I saw it, I was in rural Ohio where my parents live and I was taking my kids to get donuts one morning <laughs> and we drove by this little teeny sh shop on the square where they're at. And I was like, it was in the window and I was like, stop the car. I'm <laughs> going and looking at that dress. And it, it was so beautiful and it was way more expensive than anything that I ever buy normally. Um, and, uh, and I didn't buy it and I was like, oh no, I didn't buy it. And then it was like Sunday and she was closed. And then Monday morning at 6am, we were leaving. And I, <laughs> I ended up having to like, call her and be like, can, I hadn't tried it on. I was like, can you just ship it to you? I'm just going to get it. It was my birthday. And I was like, I'm just going to buy this dress. And I love it. It's so pretty. And I've worn it already. So I got it like a month ago. And I think I've probably worn it at least 12 times. already. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, so I love it. So <laughs> so I'm going to a hundred wares this year. Cost per wear is going down very rapidly. <laughs> awesome. So that's a that's a new one. And then I have I love things with really big crazy prints. And I have this gorgeous, um, it's probably 60s. It's like a maxi skirt, high waisted, and it's really crisp white, and it has these giant red and navy blue flowers on it with like some little like kelly green running through it and it's just this like crazy bold print and it's really like voluminous so it's like bold and then the, the shape is bold and i love that one too that's another that's another favorite that's awesome. the more obnoxious the better <laughs> my personal style that's my style my style taste is is this on the right side of wrong but like just just on the right side of wrong <laughs> I always say, you know, I, I generally like, especially when it comes to jewelry, I tend to be very minimalist. Like I, I, that doesn't mean I won't wear a statement piece, but it's like, I'm, I'll wear like one or two things, you know, mm -hmm. I don't wear a lot usually, but I feel like my, my goal for myself, you know, as I get older, as you know, I have like Iris Apfel in mind where I feel like, yes. I want yes. to be that older woman, that woman of a certain age, just with like head to toe crazy it. stuff on. I just want to wear yes. everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. That is completely my life goals. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, when it's like, when I don't have to be practical anymore and when, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I don't, I don't think that like coastal grandma is the direction that I'm going. I'm thinking like. <laughs> over the top maximalist grandma is like my totally my future well it's really it's funny that you brought that up because we are actually 
we're like changing the way we're doing some things on our website and we're about to release like a little collection based on coastal grandma and we have a little bit of an internal debate going on because part of our team feels like coastal grandma is more like frankie from grace and frankie which i think is a little more hippie than what i actually think of as coastal grandma i think of like martha stewart as coastal grandma so we have a little debate about what coastal grandma actually is mm. i'm up for your way in if you have any i suppose it depends <laughs> on you know you're obviously on your perspective but i think in terms of which how coast the trend which started it's more preppy yeah it's more yeah, it's like Gen Z, like east coast yeah like very very kind of like new england inspired but maybe with that like santa barbara or san diego twist yep yeah you know yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but go either way that hippie that hippie grandma is cool too but i think that's something else it's <laughs> a little different yeah little yeah different. that's that was my perspective as well but i was curious what you thought because i was like sure mm -hmm. yeah yeah happy happy but that's such in. an interesting point right and this is actually part of why we're doing things we're trying to take like language and keywords out of the search process for exactly this reason right we can use the same words to describe something and it means two very different things in our minds you know style is so subjective it's so visual it's so like, I'll know it when I see it, mm -hmm. that I think that's part of what makes it so difficult on a lot of the, um, the really big resale apps is that it's, it's hard to like, you have to just cross your fingers that you're going to use the keyword, like that the keyword that you think of is going to match the keyword that the person who's selling it thought of in order to find the thing that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And some things apparently, like even what a maxi skirt is, is up for debate. If you ask Poshmark seller. Wait, what? How is that up for debate? It's, it's either long for debate. or it's not. <laughs> it's not up for debate. Mini, but like knee length, go, midi, maxi. Wait, what did I miss? Go in Poshmark and seriously, it's a good experiment. You'll feel so justified in what you're doing in the world go to Poshmark and look for like do a search for maxi skirt or maxi dress and you'll see things from like above the knee to all the way to the ankle and I'm always like oh, right. <sighs> it's you know it's funny I sold a pair of shoes on Poshmark recently and it was actually the first time I had sold something because I find that I tend to use eBay more if I'm selling things mm -hmm. um I know that Poshmark is like more clothing and fashion oriented, but I also don't have time. I don't sell a lot. I have my own resale business. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a swap, You're not, whatever. Like, that's not, yeah. No, it's like, I, it's not like I have all of this time. I don't have the time that a platform like Poshmark requires of its sellers to connect and make <laughs> friends and all of this stuff. It's like, no, no that is, I do not have no. time for that. Like either somebody wants to buy what I have or not. And I, I had this pair of Poochie shoes and, um, you know, and uh, anyway, somebody bought them and they wrote back and they said, you know, these actually don't fit. So I need to return them. And, you know, Poshmark doesn't allow any returns. Like that yeah. is just their policy and they don't care if it fits or not. And that's also part of, and I knew that about Poshmark, right? But it's like, that's part of why as an individual, I wasn't, you know, I've never really been that interested in their platform. If I know what I want and I know exactly what size I need, um, I'll sometimes look on there if I'm looking for something in particular, like I, specific. Like there's a brand of bra that I wear and I know my size in that brand. And, you know, I bought a bra on there recently because I yeah. knew that, you know, and we swap bras, but I have kind of a weird size. We don't get a ton of stuff in my size. Mm -hmm. And so and I just needed a new, a new bra. But I know that like when I buy that, I can't return you know it. It's like you get it. Um, and so I had to, you know, write to this woman and I found their return policy on their website and, and explained it and everything. But it's like, you know, I feel like that is, I, I understand why they've set it up that way. 
Okay, because returns can be annoying and it can be expensive yeah. to ship things back and forth and it's inconvenient for sellers and all of that kind of stuff. But again, if you're just like a normal person and you're not trying to be a professional reseller and this isn't, you know, you just want to maybe make a little extra money on the side and get rid of stuff that you don't wear anymore. It's such an art, it's such a clunky system, right? Yeah. It's like for sellers and for buyers. And that's why, you know, for us, it's like, well, we accept all brands. Everything can be swapped back. There's mm -hmm. nothing where we're like, you can't send it back to us. You know, we everything, you know, it's yeah. like we really wanted it to be this really easy flow back and forth because, you know, returns are, are, a, are a problem, not just for resellers, but also just for normal brands too, yeah. right? But, yes. but the reality is that you really don't know if something's going to work for you or, or not until you know, until you put it on your body. And actually, I always send people to you guys for pants because pants are so, I mean, that there's an example where like I, I bought, a, I literally rebought a pair of pants that I already owned on Poshmark in the same size and they were just missized, right? So then I thought I was doing exactly what you were saying, but they still didn't fit me. And then they're still probably somewhere in my inventory. <laughs> in my unlisted inventory <laughs> <laughs> um but uh but yeah so i send i send people to you for pants all the time because i feel like that's a it's such a great system for for being able to try things on and send things back and not really like lose a lot um in doing so yeah and it's like if you you know if you love it great and you wear it a ton of times and then you get bored with it fine or you try it on and it's not quite right or whatever it's like so low risk yeah um and yeah and you mentioned accessibility for style crush you know accessibility is really important to us as well we we really want people to feel like they can swap with us and not have to shop fast fashion because that's all that they can afford because there yeah. is a higher price tag to sustainability and 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 even sometimes secondhand. What's inspiring you these days? Um, what's inspiring me is so we did this. We got to be in this accelerator that is for uh, it's specifically focused on cooperatives, but cooperatives that are built to scale. So trying to answer this question of how do you build businesses this way that can like take advantage of technology to scale, and that was amazing because. Um, as much as I love fashion and, and secondhand, and that's why I started this project to begin with, in the years that have passed since it all began, I've really become much more interested in like equitable economy and how do you build systems that help communities become enriched in all different senses of the word. Um, and so it's inspiring to me to see how many people are like thinking about this stuff and trying to 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 think about doing things differently um that's inspiring and I also love this moment that we're in it's funny I went to pick up some um some clothes from like a friend of a friend who she wants to sell with us and um we were talking about style and she's I don't know how old she is but she's definitely like my my mom's generation or maybe a little bit older and she was talking about her relationship to style and like, it was a lot about like how you're perceived like outwardly, what are your good colors and how, do, what are people gonna, you know, what like take you seriously in and what are the brands? And, and I think all of those things are legitimate. And I think that in some scenarios they can be really helpful to like helping you show up more fully um, if you feel confident in executing on that stuff. But I also feel like we're in this amazing moment with style where there's like a, the degree of authenticity is what's important. It's like, you can't really be too outrageous. You know, you can't really be like, there's no like right way to dress and wrong way to dress. There's like this proclamation of like, I'm gonna dress for myself and what brings me joy. Even if it's the thing that doesn't maybe look the best or isn't like, the what you're supposed to wear on paper and I find that really exciting and inspiring and also some like it's it calls me to unlearn things that I learned as a young person myself <laughs> watching all these 
amazing women in their 20s and 30s who are just, you know, taking like a whole different stance on style. I find that super inspiring. Yeah. What are some style rules that you grew up kind of having embedded into you that you've had to kind of unlearn? Mm, that's such a, my mom, my, I was like, I totally loved my mom's style growing up and I totally like tried to wear the things that she wore and my parents had a business. And so she was like a, like an executive, but like, you know, like a small business executive kind of thing. And, uh, I loved like, it was the nineties and like the boxy blazers and like little pointy toed flats. Um, so my mom was, I don't know if she ever like had specific rules that I absorbed from her, but she was always really put together, you know? And it was like a lot of like matching sets and like the earrings matched the necklace and like the ring, you know, like it was, it was really coordinated and that's still the, like what her style is. And, um, and I think at a certain point, probably in that journey, well, maybe sooner than that. In my 20s, I like that I was in fashion in New York and I liked kind of like that splashy, obnoxious, kind of over the top sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, that was a that was a big thing that shifted for me. And then I think I think rules about like what colors looked good on me and like what colors I should wear, or, like what shapes suited my body type and things like that. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like I love this mustard yellow sweater and I'm going to wear it even though it is the worst or like my sweater, be beige, beige is a terrible color on me, Same but I just love this dress so much that I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to wear it 12 times in a month. Because but I, all, I often, yeah, I often want to wear beige and it's like, I look terrible in beige. Why am I drawn to this color? That this dress is like me? my two worst. It's like beige and taupe and mustard yellow, all three horrible colors on me, but I love it so much. That I'm, like, <laughs> I'm going to wear it anyway. The world is insane right now. It's just Indeed it is. crazy. Um, you know, I have a lot of echo anxiety and stress about the state of world affairs and all of these things going on. And part of why I started this podcast was because I know so many people are working on really amazing things and doing really cool stuff, whether it's art or activism or cool businesses. And I find all of, hearing more about those things makes me feel <laughs> more optimistic about the exactly. future and knowing these things are happening in the world. Um, so yeah, what's, what's keeping you feeling optimistic? Um, I get a lot of optimism by looking at the way that things that were like, like the things that are becoming normalized in a good way, you know, there's, there's a lot more open dialogue and like when I look at like kids my nieces age who are all in like their late teens early 20s like they just have a different expectation of the world and they have like pretty low tolerance for bullshit you know like they're aware of like these concepts of like greenwashing they're paying attention to politics I mean that makes me feel really good you know I think that there's, uh, I feel like if we can just like shepherd through the next decade as like power is fading away from the people who hold it now, who are too many old white men and like shifting more towards a multi, truly multicultural political system, hopefully, and uh, perspectives. Like, I think that what's coming behind us is going to help just like wash everything clean of a lot of the garbage of the last 200 years. <laughs> I mean, like, how far do you want to go back? You know, um, so seeing that really inspires me. And then also just like, it's funny, my eco anxiety was very stoked the other day, however you want to say that. Um, and then I like randomly saw this article on CNN that was about people who are trying to like solve the the storage issue for renewable energy and you know I like had been in that loop before where I'm like we have to have more renewable energy but I gotta have more electric cars but then the batteries and like this and that and this article in CNN was actually about all of these like very very 
kind of analog ways that people are trying to tr to, to um, tackle this problem from like pumped hydraulic systems to like a system where literally like a crane lifts 35 ton cement blocks and like up to the, like a three story height and then lowers them to create kinetic energy when demand, like when sun and wind are low, like just like very, very analog solutions. And it led me and my kids down like an hour long curiosity time where we just like went and like Googled and looked on YouTube at like all these different ways that people are tackling um, these major problems that we have. And it was so inspiring to see like, there's some really lo-fi things that people are doing or like I was just reading about, you know, like reforestation is obviously like so buzzy, but not always working great. And I just read this amazing article. I think it was in the Atlantic about grasslands and how like amazing they are, but even the article itself like connected like grasslands and reforestation to like colonialism and this sort of inherent like white European perspective that like forests are the, pinnacle of a healthy environment you know it's just like so these nuanced conversations I find inspiring and uh yeah I'm just like trying to find them wherever I can lately also the pups and the kids yeah and <laughs> the <laughs> hummingbirds in our yard and all of all of the things <laughs> so how can people find you and style crush yeah, our website is uh, stylecrush.co and um, just like swapsociety.co, we're the co club. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's the best place to start. Um, and on Instagram, it's join style crush. Okay. And one day we'll, we're about to start posting there again. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm not a social, I'm kind of a social media fail. And we have yet to find <laughs> anybody who wants to like really come on and own that. I'm so impressed with you and Swap Society's uh, amazing commitment to social media and being <laughs> there. <laughs> I do it in like one month spurts. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, this is so good. Yeah, this is great. No, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you decide to start a podcast. <laughs> yeah, we've talked about it. And I'm like, can't I just go talk on other people's podcasts? <laughs> Thank you so much for spending time to talk with us today and sharing your story and telling it us. It was so fun as always. And um, yeah, I hope you have an amazing day. Thank you. You too. Good luck with the rest of it. <laughs> let's, go, let's go get some work done. Thank you for listening to the Swap Society podcast. Swap Society is an online clothing swap for women and kids that makes it easy and affordable to mix up your wardrobe sustainably. We're a growing community of women across the USA who are creating positive change by swapping our clothes and slowing down our fashion consumption. We would love to swap with you. If you're interested in joining, you can sign up at our website. Learn more at www.swapsociety.co. That's swapsociety.co. You can find the show notes for each episode on our website. Please get in touch with us on social media too. We're on Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and YouTube for the video version of this podcast at Swap Society. Music is by Joel Korlitz and yours truly. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Please help us spread the word by subscribing, leaving a rating and review, sharing on social media, or simply telling a friend. We really appreciate your support. Have a wonderful day. And remember to swap before you shop.